Okay. We'll be discussing the diversity, diversity of plants today. So plants play an uh, integral role in all asp aspects of life. Uh, we have depended on plant for food, medicine, and byproducts. Palm, weed, cotton, opium, all plants used around the world over. Currently, plants are thought to be monophyletic. Remember what that meant? It means one common ancestor. Transition from water to land requires strategies to avoid drying out and to disperse reproductive cells in air and structural support and to filter sunlight. So the plant kingdom, there are about 300,000 species of cataloged plants and 260 of them or 260,000 of them are seed plants. And most, most plants are photosynthetic while few parasitic plants do exist without, and they don't have photosynthesis. And plants grow indefinitely until they, they die. They reproduce by union of gametes, eggs or female gametes that are made in pistils. And the pistils are located here. And top part is called the stigma. Middle part is style. And the ovaries are located down here. And the sperm or male gametes are produced from stamens, which are located here. And they possess the anther that actually produces so-called microsporangium or gametes, the sperms. Uh, so in many uh, plants, pistils and stamens are on the same plant, and this allows self-fertilization as well as cross-fertilization. So how did uh, plants adapt to live on land? Water, obviously the water is stuff of, life, stuff of life. And the desiccation or drying out is a constant threat for organisms that are exposed to air. Typically water gives buoyancy to aquatic organisms, allowing them to support their weight, which is why whales can be so big but the land plants must so structurally support itself. And uh, also uh, male and female gametes must reach each, each other without swimming or being prevented from drying out. But life on land has advantages because abundant sunlight is unfiltered by the water and the CO2 level is higher in air. And plants supposedly came before the animals. so. There was no predation at first. And early land plants may not have lived far from an, an abundant source of water and developed the survival strategies to combat dryness. They developed dry, drought tolerance. Moss can dry out to brown mat, but it can return to healthy green when water is available. And they typically colonize places with high humidity where the droughts are rare to begin with. Like ferns uh, thrive in damp and cool places. Um, they develop drought resistance. Cactus, for instance, can minimize water loss in the first place. So basically the four major adaptation in uh, plants are alteration of generation in life cycle, formation of spores in sporangia, formation of gametes in gametangia, and apical meristem in the roots as well as shoots in vascular plants. So what is alteration of generation? Alteration of generation involves life cycle where an organism has both haploid and diploid stage. And if it's dominant haploid, we call that haplontic. If it's dominant diploid, we call that diplontic. And haplodiplontic are the plants with alteration of generations. Um, haplo haploid gametophyte develops to a diploid sporophyte, and the gametophyte uses mitosis to produce gametes, whereas sporophyte uses meiosis to produce spores. So sporophyte stage is bar barely noticeable in lower plants, moss and liverworts and so on. And the towering trees are typically diplontic, for instance, sequoias, pie, uh, pine trees, 
So here's a, a haploid gametophyte going through mitosis to produce the gametes. These gametes fuse to produce a zygote, which mitoses and goes to become sporophyte, which will go through meiosis and produce the spores. And the spores will go through meios uh, mitosis to produce a full gametophyte, and the cycle repeats. The sporophyte of a uh, seedless plant is a diploid, and it results from syngamy, or fusion of gametes. Uh, sporangia, or spores in a vessel, is the sac that contains the spores. Sporo sporocyte, or mother cell, is 2N uh, in the sporangia. And the, they, it's the uh, mother cells that make the spores that are one end, which are released and dispersed. So here, uh, here's a sporangia. Here's a, here's a 2N sporocyte in a sporophyte. And this is the underside of the leaf. And the sporocytes are located here and they go through meiosis and produce one end spores. Then these one end spores germinate and go through the mitosis to become gametophytes. And these gametophytes will produce egg and sperm, which fertilize to become the sporophyte again. And homosporous plants only make one type of spores. Seedless non-vascular plants are uh, these types of plants. Heterosporous plants make microspores, males, and megaspores, which are females. And heterospory is in a few seedless, vascular, and all seed plants. So sporangia in seedless plants, um, haploid, Spores germinate. Haploid uh, spores are here. Like I said, uh, like we said on the previous slide, and develops into the gametophyte. Gametophyte, and the gametophyte makes the gametes that fuses to produce a sporophyte. And here are the gametes fusing to become the zygote, which develops into the sporophyte. Um, Fern, and this is a, a fern plant, um, is a spor sporophyte dominant to it, whereas moss, seen here, is gametophyte dominant. So gametangia produces the gametes by mitosis, gametangia. I guess they didn't show it here. Oh, that's strange. So here's a, a spores producing young gametophyte and becomes an adult gametophyte, which possesses the gametangia that will produce gametes by mitosis. And here are the egg cells and sperm cells. And in uh, the female gametangia, Archegonia, harbors the embryo as it develops into a sporophyte. And that would be over here, sporophyte. And plants also produced um, adapted apical meristem. Thus, the tissue where shoots and the roots of the plants increase in length through rapid cell, di cell division. Tip of the shoot or root are made up of meristemic, meristematic cells. And they continue to proliferate throughout the life of the plant. And apical meristem allows the elongation at the root and shoot tips. So which allows more sunlight and more water and more minerals. The lateral meristem makes the cells increase in diameter 
of stem and the trunk. And the uh, apple seedling, seen here, has the apical narrow stems at both ends. Um, additional land plant adaptations are things like shoots that allow taller plants to capture more sunlight. Land plants need more rigid molecules in their stems. And the vascular tissue, xylem and phloem, for distribution of water and solutes. And this allows plants to have larger bodies. <clears throat> <clears throat> root for water and mineral also anchors the taller shoot in the soil. And also, they adapted a waxy, waterproof cuticle coat on leaves and stems, but prevents uptake of CO two. So it's a it's it's a mixed uh, effect. But developing stomata <clears throat> allow the regulate allow the plants to regulate the gas exchange up here, uh, and the plants also have metabolite toxins to defend against predation. And plants also developed tasty metabolites to aid in dispersal of pollens, fruits, or seeds. And uh, what else? A moss seen here grows close to the ground to prevent desiccation. We actually, we actually call it cuticle seen here. Also prevents desiccation. Maple tree seen here has needs structural uh, chemicals to strengthen their stem and vascular system. Um, and plants also developed physical and chemical defenses to avoid being eaten by animals. So there are two major divisions of land plants, two major groups, non-vascular plants and vascular plants. That non-vascular plants uh, obviously lack vascular tissues. These are things like bryophytes, <clears throat> moss, liverworts, hornworts. Vascular plants have network-like conducting tissues inside, like xylem and phloem. There are two types of vascular plants, seedless, uh, plants, fern, club moss, horsetail, those are the example, and seed plants. And seed plants include gymnosperms, cone-bearing plants, and angiosperms. These are the flowering plants. And here are the uh, table that summarizes what we just talked about that could come in useful. Here's, here are the non-vascular plants. Liverworts, hornworts, mosses, vascular plants, seedless plants, seed plants, lycophytes, terophytes, gymnosperm, and angiosperm. Next. So, what are some properties of seedless plants? Uh, they're incredibly diverse. There's only a small fraction of plants on the earth. Seedless plants dominate dominated the Carboniferous period, and they formed the coal that we uh, mine today. Seedless plants like horsetail thrive in damp, shaded area, like under the tree canopy, where the dryness is rare. And the bryophytes, in, uh, the informal grouping of uh, non-vascular plants, uh, So the, <clears throat> so the bryophytes are a, a uh, informal groupings of non-vascular plants amongst the, uh, and there are about 18,000 species, mostly in a damp habitat, as well as some in inhospitable places like, like the tundra. They lack vasculature, so water and nutrients circulate using a special conducting cells. And the vegetative organs are in haploid stage. And the sporophyte stage is barely noticeable. Sporangium is present, and the embryo remains attached to the parent plant. The uh, liverworts, hornworts, and moss make up 
at the three divisions of bryophytes. So liverworts, in a little more, de <clears throat> more detail, liver liverworts may be the plants that are most closely related to the ancestors that moved to the land. These are the liverworts here. They are called liverworts because they look like liver. They have colonized many habitats. There are about 6,000 species. They shape shaped like lobes of a liver. Here's a 1904 drawing of liverworts showing variety of their forms. And, and it, here's a, a picture, a photograph of liverwort displaying its lobate flat talus. It is in a gametophyte stage at this point. And then there are the horn, horn warts. They live in a variety of habitats. There are about 100, 100 described species. And the dominant phase is short blue-green gametophyte and a long, narrow sporophyte that emerges from the parental gametophyte remains attached to, throughout its life. So this brown structure is the sporophyte. This green structure down here is the parental sporophyte, the gametophyte. And the mosses, uh, there are about 12,000 species, species of mosses. Habitats range from tundra to uh, tropical forest. In tundra, they slow erosion, store moisture and nutrients, and they provide shelter and food for animals. And But these are sensitive to air pollution and can be used to monitor air quality. And here's a green feathery moss with reddish brown sporophyte, again, going upward from the gamut of light down here. And then there are the vascular plants. Vascular plants are the dominant group of land plants. There are over 275,000 species, and they make up more than 90% of uh, vegetation. And the vascular tissues are xylem for water and minerals, and phloem <clears throat> for transporting sugars, proteins, and solutes. They have the roots to anchor the plants to stabilize them. And they also form symbiosis with micro mycorrhiza, fungi, to increase surface area for absorption. And the leaves capture more sunlight, in, which improves photosynthesis. Things like pine cones, fern fronds, flowers are all sporophylls or modified leaves that bear sporangia. Of the, bath, uh, of the vascular plants, some have seeds and other stone. And the seedless vas vascular plants appeared by late Devonian period, which is 385 million years ago. And the sporophyte 2N became the dominant phase. Uh, these are things like club moss, horsetails, ferns, whisk ferns are the modern example. Club mosses are a small evergreen plant numbering about 1,000 species. And here's an example of club moss shown here. These small leaves are called, uh, I'm sorry, these small leaves down here are called microfilts. The other example would be Horsetails, they have a single genus, Equiseta. And the stem of horsetail has joints or nodes. And namesake Arthrophyta means jointed plant. And the needle-like shape, needle-shaped leaves do not contribute great to uh, photosynthesis, major majority of which takes in the green stem here. These are these are the needle-like leaves. And then there are the ferns and whisk ferns. Ferns are the most advanced seedless vascular plants. And they're similar to seed plants. They form large leaves, branching roots, and in contrast, uh, whisk fern lack, lack both the roots and the leaves. So here's a fern, <clears throat> short tree fern, uh, potted for uh, decoration. Ferns are the most readily recognizable seedless vascular plants. There are about 12,000 species, 
in the uh, tropics to the temperate zones. Then we come to the seed plants or the gymnosperms. Seed plants, the dominant generation is sporophyte. <clears throat> Gametophytes are reduced in size to a microscopic cluster of cells in the tissue of the sporophytes. And the seed plants tend to be heterospores. Megaspores are the female gametophytes. Microspores are the male gametophytes. Gametophytes themselves are not free living, but they mature in the spores. So sea plants have two adaptations to the drought. Those are the seeds and the pollen, which are the which were probably essential in colonization of the land, which required break from dependence on water for reproduction and development. Why is that? Because pollen can be disturbed widely because they're so small. And the seed could be, a seed could, do, could protect the embryo inside and provide nutrient and lay dormant if need be. And it's the seeds that allow dispersion of these plants over uh, time and space. So gymnosperms are a paraphyletic uh, meaning they have many ancestors. They're typically uh, character characterized by naked seeds, heterospory, pollination by winds, tracheids, for transport of water and solids, solutes. So example of conifer shows this. Pine carries both male and female sporophylls in one plant. And in male cones, meiosis gives rise to microspores that develop into pollen. And each pollen has two cells, one generated of cell and one pollen tube cells. Upon landing on female cone pollination, generated cell become two sperms and one of those sperms will fertilize the egg or the megaspore. It doesn't double fertilize like in angiosperms. We'll go over this. Uh, it's kind of hard to uh, uh, just describe this in words. Uh, so female cones have two ovules. Here's a fertilized uh, uh, fertilized egg or ovule. Here's here are the ovules. Here's the pollen grain that has landed on the female cone. Is producing uh, generative uh, sperm nuclei, and it forms the tube nucleus. And the pollen tube provides the way to the ovule or the megas megaspore. So one megaspore site undergoes meiosis in each each ovule, and one haploid will develop into female gametophyte that encloses the egg. And upon fertilization, zygote will develop into an embryo or seed. And this can take up to two years. And seed then has this, this completed seed from pine cone, has three generation of tissues, parental seed coat, female gametophyte for the nutrient, and then newly uh, fertilized embryo. So how diverse are gymnosperms? Conifers are the dominant phylum of gymnos gymnosperms and with most variety of species. Tall trees with needle-like leaves with cuticle, which minimizes the water loss. So conifers are named for their cone-bearing uh, property, but most of them have these needle-like leaves. And they're predominant in cold climates. Snow just slides off the needles and they're often harvested for pulp and timber. Here's a spruce, evergreen spruce. Here's a sihuya. Here's a juniper tree. And here's a deciduous gymnosperm. Color changes indicate leaves, leaves are about to fall. And sihuya uh, are one of the, some of the biggest, tallest trees that we have. If you go to the uh, sihuya National Park, there's a one tree 
where you can actually drive a car through. <clears throat> um, then there are the cycads that live in myoclimate climates, and they're mistaken for palm because their shape of because the shape of their leaves, compound leaves. They also have large cones, but these are pollinated by, pollinated by beetles. And these were dominant during the dinosaur age. And nowadays people just use it as a ornamental plant. Um, then there are the ginkgo phytes. There's only one species, ginkgo biloba, and they're resistant to uh, pollution. The male and females are on a separate plants. So males are only planted due to seeds um, having rancid butter oil. But ginkgo biloba seeds are actually edible. People in Asian countries, we eat them. Benitophytes, these are the closest relative to angiosperms. And these are mostly vines in tropical and subtropical zones. It's an unusual uh, desert plant. Well, which sea may live up to 2,000 years. And the genus Ephedra of Southwest US is a source of ephedra, which is a decongestant. Unlike other gymnosperms, and pinetophytes have vessels in their xylem. So then, sea plants, the other sea plants, the angiosperms. <clears throat> The angiosperms are the flowering plants, and these dominate the most terrestrial ecosystems. They have more than 260 species, 260,000 species. These are second only to the insect in terms of diversification. There's a, there are two adaptations that ensure reproductive success. One is flowers and fruits. Fruits, or rather flowers rather, allow the cooperation with animals and insects to disperse the uh, pollen in a targeted way. And the fruits protect the embryo or the seeds, and it aids in its dispersal because animals eat it and they seeds pass through. Uh, so why, how are uh, flowers <clears throat> uh, good adaptation? Flowers are modified leaves that are organized around central stalk and all flowers contain the same structures. Sepals, which encloses the flower bud before it opens, that's a green stuff that's outside. Petals are in the whorl of sepals, and usually a colorful attractor of insects. And the pistil or carpal is the female reproductive organ with ovaries inside, with one or more ovules, which develops into, seed, into seeds. Stamen is the male reproductive organ that surrounds the central pistil and contains spores that develop into pollen. So let's look at that. Here's the uh, perianth, that's the outer flower, including the corolla or the petals, and calyx or the sepals. This is the is the perianth here, which refers to this entire thing. And within the petals is the carpal made up of stigma, style, ovary, which contains the ovules, in the ovules inside. And here's a blown out picture of that. Here's a stigma on top. Style is the middle part. Then there's the ovaries containing the ovules. And this whole thing is just called the carpal and the stamen, which surrounds the carpal, or also called pistil, is made up of the filament and the anther, which contains the microspores. So here's the filament, stocky part, and at the end of it is the anther. And, and filament and the anther makes up the stamen, and anther possesses the spores microspores. So fruit, how is fruit another adaptation? Fruit is basically a fertilized and fully grown ripened ovary. Many common known veggies are actually fruits. 
eggplant, zucchini, string beans, bell peppers are fruits because they have seeds in them and they're dry from the ovary. That is the definition of a fruit. Acorns and winged maple keys are also fruits. Of the fruits, there are the fleshy fruits, then there are the dry fruits. Fleshy fruits are things like berries, peaches, apples, grapes, tomatoes. Dry fruits are things like rice, wheat, and nuts. Most people don't think of gra cereal grain as fruits, but they nonetheless are. Raspberry forms from many ovaries in one flower. Pineapple forms from cluster of many flowers. And the fruits are the agents of dispersal. And light dry fruits are carried by wind. Coconuts are carried by water. Some fruits have colors, smells, and nutrients <clears throat> for herbivores. Some have hooks that hitch a ride on animal fur and so on. So this is how fruits are capable of dispersing themselves. So what is the life cycle of an angiosperm? Sporophyte phase is the main phase of an angiosperm. And like the gymnosperms, angiosperms produce microspores that develop into pollen, megaspores that develop into ovules. And the uh, microsporangia in the anther, or yeah, microspore mother cell undergoes my meiosis and produces haploid microspores, and these will develop into pollens. And they go through pi uh, go through my mitosis and produce pollen with two cells. One is a generative cell. This makes two sperm eventually. And one is a pollen tube cells. We have talked about this briefly, similar thing, briefly in previous slides. And in the ovule, megaspore mother cell undergoes meiosis to produce four haploid megas megaspores. One of the megaspore is larger than the other and undergoes three mitosis to produce eight nuclei in seven cells. And that forms the embryonic sac. So one of the cells has two nuclei inside. And this two nuclei in, uh, cell fuses to form two N nucleus. And then cell moves into the sac, middle of the sac. And that's shown here. Here's the ovary. Here's a macro a macrospore ovule or megaspore ovule. Its cells are dividing, 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 going through meiosis and produces four cells. One, two, three, four. And all of these are haploid. And this particular one, I believe, is the one with two. Anyway, these two, these um, go through mitosis again to produce eight nuclei. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight nuclei. So the nuclei are shown in red dot. And these form, this middle part is an entire cell. And currently this is the 2N nucleus. And then the one egg and two cell move into one end of the sac. And the durable fertilization occurs once pollination happens, which is unique to angiosperms. It has to be fertilized twice. So let's look at this a little more in a little more detail. So the pollen tube enters the uh, ovule. Here's the ovule. Here's the pollen tube. Here's a tube nucleus of the pollen tube cell. And here are the two sperm nuclei. And once it enters like this, This uh, sperm nuclei will move into fertilize one of the eggs here, and the two N cell. So one sperm and the egg will form the zygote, two N embryo, 
that's this is the embryo. This will become the embryo. And the other sperm and the center cell with polar nuclei, this is the center cell, will form the endosperm, which is in this case, 3N nutrient reserve, nutrient reserve. And that's the endosperm here. Here's the embryo formed here. And this zygote develops into an embryo with a root radical and leaves cotyledon. And that's where the names monocots and dicots come from. And you have seen that in your lab. Uh, and the seed consists of tough coat, endosperm with food, and then the embryo is protected inside. So the anthers and ovaries of angiosperms are the structures that shelter the actual gametophytes, the pollen grain and the embryo sac. And the double, double fertilization is process unique to angiosperms. If a, a flower lacked megasporangium, what kind of what type of gamete would it not be able to form? If it lacked a microsporangium, what kind of gamete would it not be able to form? <clears throat> megasporangium is the female. Microsporangium is the male. So you should be able to think through that. And the whole process we just talked about is shown in just one uh, one mm -hmm. graphic here. Same thing we just talked about is shown here. Here's the fully developed megagametophyte or the embryo sac. And here's the fully developed microgametophyte or the pollen and if pollen goes into the stigma remember stigma up here and shoots down to one of the ovules and fertilizes one of the eggs and then fertilizes the center egg with the two nuclei then double fertilization is complete and that will develop into the seed shown here, encasing the embryo inside, possessing the endosperm, that's 3N, co all covered by seed coat. So most flowers of angiosperms carry both stamens and carpels, but few species self-pollinate and these are known as the perfect flowers. Self-pollination is a form of inbreeding that can inc increase genetic defects. But we have seen many examples of self-pollination during genetics section, Mendelian genetics section. Peas were chosen because of that ability by Mendel. So one barrier to self-fertilization is to have different sex flowers. So monoecious plants have perfect or imperfect flowers on one plant. Uh, there will be male flower and female flower. Dioecious plants have male and female flowers on different plants. So here's an example of monoecious uh, plant having both female flower here and male flower here. And same thing here, male flower, female flower on the same plant. But dioecious actually have separate male and female plants. Here's a male plant, male plant rather, and here's a female plant. And angiosperms, uh, uh, there are two main groups of flowering plants. The one is monocots and the other is dicot or eudicots. And the basal angiosperms uh, exhibit traits of both monocots and dicots. 
and they are categorized separately into magnolida. And magnolida include magnolia, laurel tree, and this is where the bay leaves come from, cinnamon, spice bush, piperales, or black pepper. All these are spice uh, things that are eaten. And the pictures of those are shown here. So the monocots, we said, uh, we briefly said monocots and dicots are the two groups. Monocots have one cotyledon, and their veins run parallel to the length of the leaves. Flowers are in three or six fold symmetry, and the pollens show one furrow or pore. And true woody tissue is rarely found in monocots, and they lack vascular patterns. There's no major tap root. And many of the crops are monocots. Cereal, corn, sugarcane, pineapple, and bananas, they're all monocot plants. <clears throat> Dicots or eudicots have two cotyledons. And they form network in leaves, the veins do. And flowers are usually four or five many whorls, or, or many, yeah. And the pollen show three furrows of pores. They can be herbaceous or woody. And the vascular tissues typically form a ring in the stems. And it has one main root. And dicots make up two thirds of all flowering plants. <clears throat> Classification of plant as monocot or eudicot is not always simple. Uh, here's a rice plant here, which is a monocot. Uh, here's a bean, picture of beans. It's a castor bean. Here's a picture of lily, which is also a monocot, but daisy are dicots or eudicots. So bean and daisy are both eudicots or dicots. So what, what role does a uh, seed plant play? They play a key role in maintenance of terrestrial ecosystem through stabilizing soil, cycling carbon, moderating climate change, or climate moderation rather. <clears throat> And large tropical forests also release oxygen and acts as a carbon dioxide sink. And sea plants provide shelter to many life forms, as well as well as food for herbivores. Herbivores, but and thereby thereby also indirectly feeding the carnivores. And plants' secondary metabolism. Or secondary, secondary metabolites are often used for medicinal purposes or industrial production. Virtually all life, and all animal life, is dependent on plants for survival. So, herbivory, consumption of plants by insects and animals, to defend against that, plants have adapted many defense mechanisms. The seeds are highly, uh, seeds that are high in alkaloids which makes them undesirable. They also have thick bark, spines, and thorns. And herbivory also allows wide dispersal of plant's genetic material, which is why, on the other hand, they don't want to get eaten, but they also want to spread uh, widely, so they develop fruits and seeds. So 80% of angiosperm depend on animal for pollination. Uh, many birds or insect uh, pollinates uh, flower, have nectar. So birds and insects are drinking the nectar and in doing so, they're pollinating the flowers. Insects have this mechanism, have this uh, special uh, visual ability to recognize patterns in flowers in the UV range, and which allows them to locate the center of the flower fast. And uh, disruptions like bee colony collapse could lead to disaster in agricultural industry, which is occurring currently. Bee 
and nobody really knows the exact reason why. So sea plants, how important are sea plants to humans? Well, sea plants are the foundation of human diets. Cereal are the staple in many human diets. Beans and nuts supply proteins. Fats can be also be derived from crushed seeds. And medicinal plants, uh, uh, medicinal properties of plants have been known for a very long time. And references to use of plants' cura curative properties are found in Egyptian, Babylonian, Chinese writing going back 5,000 years. And many modern medications have their origins in plant metabolites. And here are some, here's a, a table of, nobody really, had, you don't have to memorize all this, but just to give an example, deadly nightshade produces atropine. Atropine dilates eyes for eye exam. Foxglove produces digitalis, and this is, this is used to stimulate the heartbeat. Yam, the common yam, produces steroid, and we use that to produce steroid hormones, contraceptive pills, and cortisone system. Ephedra, we talked about it, talked about this. Ephedra is a decongestant and bronchial dilator. Pacific yew tree produces taxol, and this is a cancer therapy drug. It inhibits mitosis by arresting at the metaplate. It prevents uh, microtubule depolymerization. Opium poppy, obviously opioids, it's an analgesic, it's a painkiller, narcotics. Quinine tree produces quinine, and it's an antipyretic or lowers body temperature, and it's also anti-malarial. And the willow tree, produces salicylic acid that forms the aspirin. It's an analgesic and anti-pyretic. <clears throat> um, we'll end there for today. <laughs>